Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. He is risen. And I can hear you all saying together in response, He is risen indeed. This is Resurrection Sunday. We are so glad to be able to worship to Him together and celebrate uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's sad that we can't um, do this together this year because of the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, just to remind you, all gatherings of the church will be canceled until the shelter-in-place order is lifted. Uh, But we pray that God will bless you as you celebrate in worship this momentous occasion of Christ's resurrection uh, on the first day of the week uh, over 2,000 years ago. It is the heartbeat of our faith. It is our joy. So we pray that the Lord will bless you as you celebrate it together. Just a reminder of a few things by way of announcement before we begin. Travis and I, as your pastors, will be continuing to provide you with some sort of ministry item each weekday through email and Facebook, so please take advantage of those. We've designed them to build you up in the faith in this time when we can't be together physically. Also, we want to continue to encourage you to seek out creative ways to fellowship together with your fellow members in this church through the use of technology. So phone calls, text messages, emails, Facebook, virtual meetings through Zoom or Google Hangouts. Use these things to fellowship with one another and even to reach out to the lost around you. We also want to remind you just to continue to give. Uh, You can send your uh, giving in through mail or you can drop it uh, underneath the door of the office, uh, or you can use your bank's bill pay service to arrange to have payment, uh, your giving sent to the church. And we would just encourage you to remember to do that. And then also, finally, if because of the economic downturn, you have financial needs, please don't hesitate to contact us. You can contact Pastor Travis or I, or you can reach out to one of the deacons. We, the deacons recently sent out an email with all their contact information, encouraging those in need to contact them. We want to help you if you are in need as much as we can. Well, with those announcements aside, let's begin our time with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for rescuing us out of sin and death and condemnation and bringing us into union with your Son by causing us to be born again of the Spirit and granting us repentance and faith in the gospel. We thank you for all that comes with that, the forgiveness of our sins, peace with you, and adoption into your family as your beloved children, an inheritance in the world to come, the kingdom of our Lord and Savior. We thank you especially this day that you have raised your son Jesus Christ from the dead and that he is now at your right hand, alive again in the body as our eternal prophet, priest, and king. We thank you for his perpetual ministry on our behalf and the fact that Having risen, he will return to raise us from the dead on the last day. That is our hope in the face of sin and death. And so, Father, fill our hearts with joy this morning. Fill our hearts with peace. Fill our hearts with great hope as we contemplate and celebrate the resurrection of your Son in worship of you this morning. Build us up in the faith and get glory to yourself. We pray through it all in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord is risen today, Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high, Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Oh, 
Well, we are going to now spend some time reading the scriptures together. Our scripture reading, because it's Resurrection Sunday, is going to be John nineteen thirty-eight through John twenty thirty-one. And when we turn after that to a time of corporate prayer, we are going to pray for a local church in our city. This morning, we're going to pray for Reading Christian Fellowship and their elders, including John Craft, as well as uh, a local ministry that we uh, pray for and support, Life Light Christ- Pregnancy Resource Center. And so let's uh, first read the scriptures and then go to the Lord in prayer together. First, let's read together John 19, verse 38 through John twenty. 31. And remember, as we read, this is the word of the Lord. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as it is is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, 
They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven of them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twins, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them, although the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen. That's the reading of God's word. And now let's go to prayer to the Lord together as a local church. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we give you praise for the testimony through your Apostle, of the glorious resurrection of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we read these words, and you have blessed us with the ability by the Spirit to believe in him, though we have not seen him alive in the body, as the disciples did. We thank you for that. And Lord, we know that believing, we have life in your name, not just physical life, but eternal life, an eternal life that breaks even into this world so that we now have passed from life to death and that though we die in the body someday, yet we will not die in our souls but go to be with the Lord in heaven forever. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the hope that the resurrection of Jesus gives us, that he is not dead but he is alive again 
and willing and able to save us. Indeed, we know that he has saved us and that he intercedes uh, before your presence on our behalf as our advocate, that his blood and wounds plead for our forgiveness and that he now stands ready to minister to us in our times of need. And we thank you that he, having purchased us, will come again to save us from the wrath to come, to raise us in glorious bodies like his own, and to bring us into the new heavens and the new earth. O oh God, in that day we will enter into your rest in a full and final way. And we thank you for all of this that you have accomplished through your Son and applied to us by your Spirit. We pray that you would deepen our understanding of these things and deepen our appreciation of these things, that we might walk in greater joy and in greater hope and in greater faith and in greater love for Christ and love for each other as a result. Please forgive us of the times when we struggle with unbelief like Thomas did, when we struggle because we see in, as in a mirror darkly and when we find our souls questioning in the midst of trials and tribulations, Lord, dispel the clouds. Help us to overcome doubt. Forgive us for it and strengthen us to believe and to walk by faith, even as Abraham did and the patriarchs and the many heroes of faith before us. And Father, we praise you that in the face of a crisis like the COVID-19 crisis, that we have the hope of the resurrection, that even as people are dying throughout the world and in our country, Lord, that you have offered hope in the midst of all this in the resurrection. And we pray that many people would be saved during this crisis through your people who are going out and sharing the good news across the world uh, to dying sinners. And Lord, we pray that you might strengthen and refine your church through uh, the trials of this crisis. We pray for our government, O oh Lord. Be with our civil leaders at the state and federal level. Give them wisdom, even despite their sin and unbelief where that is present, Lord. Give them wisdom to lead us through this in the best way possible. And Lord, we pray that you would pour out your spirit upon this nation to bring repentance to many through it and that we would be humbled as a nation through this. And Lord, we pray that you would do many mighty things through this trial. Lord, build your church, we pray, even through it. Father, we think of our own congregation and the financial needs that may arise or have already arisen as a result of the economic downturn that has come about by this crisis. We pray for your provision. You are able to provide for all of our needs. We know that, but we just confess our faith and trust in you to do so. Lord, be with each person as they struggle perhaps with fear or anxiety over these things. Strengthen them to cast their cares upon you and to leave them there with you and to have peace in knowing your protection and provision. And Father, we think of the many people in our church who have either, are either elderly um, and, or have pre-existing physical conditions that would make them especially vulnerable to the virus. We know that you're in charge of all these things. We know you, you know their needs, but we cry out to you for protection of them, Lord that you protect our dear brothers and sisters from becoming uh, sick with the virus and or worse. So, Father, uh, we know, though, that whatever you ordain, you must give us the strength and you will give us the strength to endure it. So we pray for that as well. And Father, finally, we lift up other churches in our city who are going through similar circumstances as us, not able to meet together. We pray, Father, that you might give them strength, that you might refine them through this. We pray that you would grow them spiritually as they're now having to walk with you in more difficult circumstances. We pray that you would provide for their needs, that you would protect them from the virus, that you would cause them to become fruitful in their ministry as they share the gospel with those around them. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for them. Reading Christian Fellowship especially in that regard. And for the leadership, John Kraft and the other elders, please give them love for their flock, wisdom in leading the flock through this, uh, strengthen them to do so. Father, please bless that church, we ask. And Father, finally, for Life Light Pregnancy uh, 
Resource Center. We, we know, Father, that the death toll from this vi- virus pales, pales in comparison to the death toll of unborn children as a result of abortion. We pray that you would bring great conviction to our nation and that you would bring abortion to an end and that you would increasingly restrict access to it, Father, for the preservation of those unborn lives. And Father, we pray that you would have mercy on us in the midst of your judgment as a result of the great blood guilt of our land. And we pray, Father, that many who would are considering abortion would be, uh, Lord, averted from it and granted the resources that they need to carry their child to full term and either raise them themselves or offer it up for adoption uh, through Life Light Pregnancy Resource Center. Pray, we pray for them that you would have mercy upon them, provide for their needs, even through this time of financial hardship, and sustain their ministry so that they might be able to minister effectively uh, to those in our community. So Lord, we commit all of these things to you. We ask them in the name of our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen and reigning. And we pray it for our good and your glory. Amen. Stone is rolled. 
would bring you down to earth? What king would take a low and lowly birth? Yet to this dark and broken place you came to sleep beneath the stars that you had made. the road rejected and despised, that you might know the weakness I possess, and be my rock of strength and righteousness. Oh, your love, my God, like a flood. As heaven opened up, pouring out on us, oh praise the King who came to the world in His love like a mighty flood. Bear that overwhelming death for me. The Son of Heaven leaves the Father's side. The healer pleads, the life was made to die. Oh, your love, my God, like a flood. As heaven opened up, pouring out on us, oh, praise the King who came to the world in His love like a mighty flood. strong enough to come and fight for me, to go through hell and down into the grave, and raise me up to see you face to face. You raise me up to see you face to Amen. Well, we're going to come now uh, to a time of preaching of the Word. And I've decided to preach on the resurrection from John's Gospel. And so, 
Our text is going to be John chapter 11, verses 1 through 44. As you're turning there, let me just say a few things by way of introduction. This, of course, is Easter Sunday, the Sunday that the church celebrates the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day after his death. The resurrection of Jesus is the grand finale of what is called Holy Week. More than that, it's the grand finale of the gospel message itself. The four accounts of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which we have in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each end with a record of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Indeed, without the resurrection, that is, if Jesus did not really rise from the dead in the body on the third day after his death, then the entire Christian faith, we don't mind saying, is fraudulent. As the Apostle Paul so famously put it in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14 through 19, he said, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. But in fact, he went on to say, Christ has been raised from the dead, and so the Christian faith is true, and our hope in Christ is not in vain. But why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ so important to Christianity? What does it mean for us as Christians? And in order to answer that question, I want to take you back to an event which occurred in the days leading up to his own resurrection at the end of that first Holy Week. The story is recounted for us by the Apostle John in the 11th chapter of his account of the Gospel. So, let's read that passage of Holy Scripture together, John 11, verses 1 through 44. John 11, verses 1 through 44. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection in the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. That's the reading of God's word. And let's just pray that he would bless this passage of scripture to our souls. Father, we know that your word is light and truth and nourishment to our souls. Please come and illumine our hearts with it and feed our souls and strengthen them. Instruct us and guide our feet, we pray. In Jesus' name, for our good and your glory. Amen. The story recorded in these verses unfolds in three main stages. First, Jesus heard his friend Lazarus was sick and delayed going to him. That's verses 1 through 16. Second, Jesus arrived after Lazarus had died and talked with his two sisters. That's verses 17 through 35. And third, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead in verses 36 through 44. So let's walk through each of these three stages of the story together. First, Jesus heard his friend Lazarus was sick and delayed going to him in verses 17 through 24. Jesus heard his friend Lazarus was sick and delayed going to him in verses 17 through 24. The previous chapter, John chapter 10, ended with a dramatic scene which took place in the temple at Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication. Jesus had made the shocking public statement, I and the Father are one. And the Jews had responded by picking up stones and saying, we are going to stone you for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. The closing verses of the 10th chapter tell us that Jesus, quote, escaped from their hands and went away across the Jordan, that is, beyond the eastern border of Israel. And there he ministered for a while, out of the reach of his enemies, waiting until the appointed hour when he would return to Jerusalem one last time to be arrested, condemned, and crucified. And it is into this situation that John chapter 11, verse 1, opens with these words. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary and Martha were well-known acquaintances and devoted disciples of Jesus. Luke's gospel, written decades before John's gospel, recounted the story of Jesus sitting and teaching in their house. And John tells us in verse 2 here that it was Mary who had anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair in the days leading up to his death. Now, John introduces us to the fact that Mary and Martha also had a brother named Lazarus. Apparently, Lazarus, too, was a close friend and follower of Jesus because the text tells us that when he became ill, Mary and Martha, his sisters, sent word to Jesus across the Jordan saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. 
The sisters' intention by that message, of course, was clear. They expected that when Jesus heard his beloved friend Lazarus was sick, he would immediately come to Bethany uh, to help him out. No doubt Mary and Martha hoped that Jesus would arrive in time to heal their brother from his sickness as he had done for so many others in Israel. The question then arises, what would Jesus do? And this is where the story takes a strange turn. Look closely at what it says in verses 5 through 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now that is a very strange statement. Notice what it says. Jesus received the message from Mary and Martha that his beloved friend Lazarus was sick. But instead of dropping everything and leaving immediately to come to Bethany and help him, Jesus, it says, intentionally delayed, staying two days longer in the place where he was. And here's the kicker. Why does the text say that Jesus delayed his coming for two days? Look at the text again. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so... When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Did you see it? The reason Jesus delayed and didn't leave for Bethany right away was because he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. That's what the text says. There's no getting around it. So what's going on here? In what possible way could Jesus' love for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus motivate him to delay coming to them in their time of great need? If he really loved them, wouldn't he leave for Bethany as soon as he heard that Lazarus was sick? The answer to this riddle, of course, is found only when we understand the radically different way in which Jesus viewed this whole event. We get our first glimpse at Jesus' different perspective about what was happening when we read his initial reaction to the news that Lazarus was sick in verse 4. He said, This illness does not lead to death, It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. That was his perspective about this event. Jesus knew that his friend Lazarus was mortally ill and was going to die, but he also saw that God's purpose for the death of Lazarus was that he, the Son of God, may be glorified through it. How would this happen? Well, in verse 4, Jesus says, This illness does not lead to death. Now, we know that Lazarus would indeed die, but Jesus is saying that his death would not be the end of the story. Rather, Jesus would raise Lazarus from the dead. And in this way, the death of Lazarus would ultimately become a means through which people would see the glory of Jesus and put their faith in him as the Christ, the Son of God. And you see, Jesus knew that This was the most important thing in the world for mankind. Jesus knew that he was God's unique son sent into the world to save sinners from the consequences of their sin. And therefore, the only hope for human beings was to believe in him, that he might give them eternal life. This is why the Gospel of John records Jesus as saying things like, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he shall be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Jesus knew that he was the only hope for human beings. Apart from him, they were slaves to sin, under God's righteous judgment. Only by believing in him as the Son of God and Savior of the world could they be rescued from perishing and receive eternal life. As Jesus so famously put it in John 3, 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is why it says that Jesus was motivated by love for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus when he delayed his coming to them for two days. He knew that by delaying his coming by two days, they would be caused to see a more spectacular display of his glory. How? Well, verse 17 tells us that when Jesus finally did arrive in Bethany, Lazarus already had been dead for four days. 
In verse 39, Martha even remarked that his body had already begun to stink because of decomposition. You see, because of Jesus' two-day delay, there would be no doubt in anyone's mind that this man was truly dead. And therefore, when Jesus raised him from the dead, it would be an even more spectacular revelation to all who saw it, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. So it was because Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that he stayed two days longer in the place where he was so that through the resurrection of Lazarus after four days in the tomb, they might have an increasing knowledge of his glory and an enlarged faith in him. And he knew that this was the most important thing he could do for them if he loved them. This same theme surfaces again in verses 7 through 16, when after two days, Jesus finally said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples pointed out that it would be dangerous to do so, since you remember I said at the beginning that the last time they were there, the Jews had tried to stone him. But Jesus insists in verse 11, saying, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And as is common in the Gospel of John, the disciples don't understand what he's saying. They think that sleep meant uh, just falling asleep physically. They didn't realize that it was a metaphor for death. And so they protested, saying, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. So Jesus told them plainly, it says, verse 14, Lazarus has died. But then he added this interesting comment in verse 15. He said, and for your sake, I am glad, glad, Lord, that Lazarus had died. Yes, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus meant that he was glad he hadn't been there to prevent Lazarus from dying. Why? It was for their sake, so that they might believe. In other words, Lazarus' death provided him with an opportunity to manifest his glory to his disciples through a demonstration of his resurrecting power so that their faith in him might grow and be enlarged. And that was more important than prolonging Lazarus' life. You see, it's the same theme all over again. And so, the profound point that emerges repeatedly in the first 16 verses of the passage is that the most important thing in the world for human beings is to see the glory of Jesus Christ and to believe in him as the Son of God. Jesus shows that he is more committed to this goal in the lives of those he loves than he is to keeping them from grief or pain or sorrow or even physical death in this life. Brothers and sisters, one of the great challenges of our faith as Christians is the fact that God so often decides to do things that are so different than what we think is best. Things that seem so good and necessary to us, he withholds. And things which seem so terrible and detrimental to us, he chooses to allow. But what this passage begins to help us see is that God does not see things the way that we do. And so he doesn't do things the way that we would. The reason God's choices are often so confounding to us is because his holy character and wisdom is so far beyond our own. In reality, We are all like little children who react with dismay at their parents' decisions because their perspective of reality is so small and confined compared with their parents. When we are convinced that we know what is best in a situation and God chooses to do something different, it's because we simply don't realize how little we see and know in comparison with Him. One of the things this passage teaches us about the perspective of God is that from his vantage point, the most important thing in life for human beings is to see the glory of Jesus Christ so that they might believe in him as the Son of God and Savior of the world. And therefore, the greatest act of love which he could perform on our behalf as Christians is to continually increase our knowledge of Jesus Christ in all of his glory and to continually enlarge our faith in him. And we must realize that. Because God does love us. This priority shapes all, therefore, that he decides to do in our lives as his people. And you see, because God's priority for us is not worldly comfort, but deepening faith in his son, Jesus Christ. So then, just as he was with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus and his disciples, 
So God is willing to put us through any number of painful and difficult experiences in life in order to accomplish this goal. He is willing to wrench from our hands the thing that we cherish most in the world. He is willing to crush the dreams we have for this life. He is willing to withhold the things that we desperately long for. He's even willing to allow evil to be committed against us if in his perfect wisdom he knows that through those things we will gain a more profound and rich experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ in the fullness of his glorious identity so that our personal trust in him might grow. So for instance, brothers and sisters, God is pleased to allow us to grieve in order that we might know Christ as the comforter. God is pleased to allow us to suffer the loss of our possessions in order that we might know Christ as the faithful provider. God is pleased to allow us to suffer injustice in order that we might know Christ as our refuge and vindicator. And as we see in this passage, God is even pleased to allow us to face the horrors of death in order that we might know Christ as the one who gives resurrection and eternal life. And it is the greatest act of love for God to choose these things for us, because there is no more important thing for us in the world than knowing Jesus Christ and learning to trust in Him. So, brothers and sisters, let us strive to make this priority of God our own priority as well. Let us strive to be able to say with Paul, I count everything as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And in every circumstance of our lives, let us look for the way in which God is going to reveal to us the glory of Christ in new ways and enlarge our faith in Him. So in verses 1 through 16, Jesus heard his friend Lazarus was sick and delayed. Now in verses 17 through 35, Jesus arrived after Lazarus had died and talked with his two sisters. Jesus arrived after Lazarus had died and talked with his two sisters, verses 17 through 35. Verse 17 sounds this ominous note. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. He was long buried, and as Martha would indicate in verse 39, his body had already begun to decay. All that was left at this point was a process of public mourning. We know that the family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus was wealthy because in the next chapter, Mary would pour out onto Jesus a whole bottle of extremely expensive anointment. But it seems that they were also a very prominent family in the Jewish community surrounding Jerusalem. Because as verses 18 through 19 say, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So by the time Jesus arrived, there was undoubtedly quite a scene in Bethany. In addition to the large crowd of acquaintances from Jerusalem come to comfort the family in their loss, there would have been a host of professional mourners and musicians playing dirges and offering loud wailings and lamentations, along with Mary and Martha as they mourned over the death of their brother. This was all standard in that day. Then we see in verse 20 that while Jesus was still outside the village, Martha, the older and more assertive sister, by Luke's account, heard that he was coming and went out to meet him. Apparently, she wanted a private meeting with the Lord before the news of his arrival was made known to the rest. Martha began in verse 21 by saying, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here, Martha expressed the longings of a grieving heart. As Martha had watched helplessly while her brother's life had ebbed away, no doubt she had said to herself again and again, if only Jesus were here. She knew that Jesus had the power to heal the sick. If he hadn't been so far away when Lazarus fell ill, Jesus could have prevented him from dying. But instead he had not been there and Lazarus had died. Then Martha added this note in verse 22, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Now, this is not, I think, a hint that Martha was still hoping Jesus might raise Lazarus from the dead. After all, later on in verse 39, when Jesus commanded that Lazarus' grave be opened, she protested. She said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days. 
Clearly, the possibility of an immediate re- resurrection wasn't even on her radar screen. No, rather, what I think Martha's words were, were is just simply an expression of her enduring faith in the Lord. Even though he had not been there to save her brother, she's saying that she still believed that Jesus was the Son of God who enjoyed a unique relationship with the Father. I know whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And yet at this very point, Jesus pressed in to challenge the depth of Martha's faith in him. In fact, he was about to show her that her faith had yet to grasp the fullness of his glorious identity as the Son of God. He began in verse 23 by saying to her, your brother will rise again. Now, of course, to those of us who have already read John's gospel, and we know the end of this story, that statement is, as Don Carson put it, wonderfully ambiguous, isn't it? Because we know that Lazarus would indeed rise again that very hour. But for Martha, who did not know the end of the story, this statement seemed simply to be a comforting reminder that according to the teaching of the Old Testament, Lazarus, with all of God's people, would be raised from the dead on the last day. So Daniel, for instance, had said in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so Martha responded to Jesus in verse 24, saying, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now Jesus had drawn her in to consider the subject of resurrection. In the wake of her brother's death, she had confessed her hope in the future resurrection of God's people, but she had not understood the significance of Jesus' role in that resurrection. And so Jesus delivered to her the incredible pronouncement regarding his identity that we see here. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? In order to understand the import of this statement, I want, I want you to step back for a moment and consider the significance of what resurrection is. Its significance is depicted perfectly in this passage. Jesus speaks to a woman whose brother has just died. And he said to her, your brother will rise again. Now, do you feel the impact of that? Resurrection is the triumph of life over death. It is the death of death. To say that a person will be resurrected is to announce that death will not be their ultimate end. Though they may die, they will live again. Resurrection takes the ultimate sting, you see, out of the threat of death because it promises that death will not be permanent but will be swallowed up by life in the end. So Martha had confessed her belief that God would one day resurrect his people from the dead and Jesus responded by making the audacious claim, I am the resurrection and the life. In other words, Jesus was claiming that God's purpose and power for the resurrection of his people was centered in him. He was the hope of life beyond the grave. He embodied the death of death because he was the locus of resurrection power. In fact, it's even better than that. Notice how Jesus unfolded the declaration, I am the resurrection and the life, in two subsequent phrases, each phrase highlighting a distinct aspect of what he meant. So first he said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Now, this is the language of future bodily resurrection. Look again at what he said. Though he die, that is, though he suffer physical death in the present, yet he shall live. He shall be raised again to life in the future. This was the expectation that Martha had expressed for her brother. Even though he had died, she believed he would one day rise again on the last day. But notice what Jesus was doing here. He was declaring this future bodily resurrection of God's people would only happen through him. Only those who believed in him would partake in the future resurrection of God's people. In fact, he'd already said back in John chapter 5, verses 28 through 29, that he was the one who would personally bring about that future resurrection of the people of God. He had said, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice, that is the voice of Jesus the Son, and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. You see, Jesus himself 
was the resurrection. Only those who believed in him as the Son of God would be raised to everlasting life at the end of the age, and he himself would be the one to call them out of the tombs on that day. But then second, Jesus also said, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here was an even more striking claim. This claim didn't refer to future resurrection, but of death conquering life given to men right now in the present. Before Jesus had said those who believe in him and then die will live again. Now he said that those who live and believe in him will actually never die. This is a reference to eternal life made available in the present. Right now, eternal life in John's gospel, by the way, is that new spiritual life of a soul which has come out from under the wrath of God and passed into fellowship with God and his favor. It is the new birth of the heart by the spirit, which Jesus spoke of in John chapter three. And this eternal life of the soul once received cannot be extinguished by physical death. It is in this way that Jesus can say here, everyone who lives in the present with this eternal life of the soul shall never die. Jesus had described the same reality earlier in John chapter 5, verse 24, when he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has, present tense, eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has, present tense, passed from death to life. The one who has eternal life has passed from death to life. His soul has already been brought from death to life in the present, and the eventual death of his body will not snuff out that new life. But notice again how Jesus put himself forward as the agent through which this eternal life would come to the man in the present. He declared, I am the life. Because the only way anyone can experience this spiritual life of the soul in the present is to believe in him. As he says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, do you see what Jesus was saying to Martha? Martha's brother had died and she was taking comfort in the fact that he would be raised again on the last day. And now Jesus is saying to her, Martha, don't you see? All your hopes of resurrection from the dead are embodied in the person who is standing right in front of you. I am the resurrection and the life. I will raise the dead on the last day. And I bring eternal life to men in the present. Everyone who believes in me has victory over death, both in the future and already in the present. Do you believe this? Have you come to see this about my identity, Martha? Have you come to personally trust in me to be such a one for you? Martha's response is recorded in verse 27. It's the response of every man, woman, and child must have to the truth of this passage if they are to have any hope of life in the face of death. She said, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God who is coming into the world. In verses 28 through 31, Martha returned to the house after her conversation with Jesus and told her sister Mary that Jesus had asked to see her. But Mary would not be given a private conversation with her Lord like Martha had because she was followed by those who were mourning with her. And when Jesus saw this retinue of mourners approaching with Mary, all weeping over the death of Lazarus, verse 33 says, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Then he directed that they lead him to the tomb of his friend. And there, verse 35 says, Jesus wept. In this scene, We see the second Adam, Jesus, beholding the terrible effects of the first Adam's sin and responding to it in outrage and grief. So, in verses 17 through 35, Jesus arrived with Lazarus after Lazarus had died and talked with his two sisters. Now, in verses 36 through 44, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, verses 36 through 44. The deadness, everything about this ancient account is meant to highlight that on that day, 
an utterly dead man was resurrected by the power and the authority of the man Jesus Christ. So you see the deadness of the man is highlighted by Martha's words in verse 39 when Jesus gave the order to take away the stone from the mouth of the tomb and she said, Lord, by this time there will be an odor for he has been dead four days. What was about to happen was no mere resuscitation of a man who only appeared to be dead but was not. There could be no doubt that the man who was raised was truly dead because his body had already begun to stink from composition, decomposition. The resurrection itself was a result of the words of Jesus Christ. Lazarus, come out! This man, Jesus, you see, had the power and authority to raise the dead. And the reality that the one who had truly died was also truly resurrected is just made certain by the details of verse 44. The man who had died came out his hands and his feet bound with linen straps and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. See, this was no mere spiritual apparition. It wasn't the ghost of Lazarus who appeared at the mouth of the cave. No, the text emphasizes that the very same dead body which had been wrapped in linens and buried in the tomb now shuffled out of the tomb a living man again in response to Jesus' mighty call. Jesus Christ truly raised the man Lazarus from the dead. But we must remember, as we witness this event by means of the scripture, that the resurrection of Lazarus was not significant in and of itself. I mean, after all, Lazarus was simply raised to his old body to live a few more weary years as a sinner in a fallen world and then finally die again. Rather, the significance of the resurrection of Lazarus lay in the fact that it was a miraculous sign performed by Jesus, which, as signs do, pointed to a glorious aspect of his identity as the Christ, the Son of God. So just as Jesus' feeding of the 5,000 signified that he is the bread of life, just as Jesus' healing of the lame man on the Sabbath signified that he is the Son of God, just as Jesus' healing of the man born blind signified that Jesus is the light of the world. Well, so Jesus' raising of Lazarus from the dead was the climactic sign of his ministry and signified that he is the resurrection and the life. The one who has the power and authority is the Son of God to say, come forth. And by this word of command, raise men from eternal death to eternal life. So as we behold this final sign of Jesus in raising Lazarus from the dead, the words of Jesus to Martha in verse 40 just ring out to all of our ears. Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Friend, if you view this miracle with the eyes of faith, you will see in it the glory of God in Jesus Christ. You will see this sign as bearing witness to the truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who was sent by God to give resurrection and eternal life to any man, any woman, any child who will look to him from under the shadow of death and put their trust in him. Right now, the news is providing us with an updated death toll from the coronavirus. We are all washing our hands and staying inside of our houses in order to avoid getting the virus and possibly dying. Tens of thousands have died from the virus around the world. And of course, the virus is only one cause of death among many. Indeed, the daily death toll in our world from these other causes dwarfs that of the virus. Nevertheless, The coronavirus pandemic has had the effect of reminding us all of our mortality. And as we see pictures of rows of people on ventilators and makeshift morgues, it should be a sober reminder to us that death is a terrible thing. 
To see a human being created in the image of God become a cold, lifeless, dead body is a horrible tragedy. It is not the way it was supposed to be because God did not originally create men to die. Rather, death is the awful consequence of human sin and rebellion against God. Even as Paul said in Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And yet it must also be pointed out That physical death, as awful as it is, is actually only a relatively benign initiation into a far more terrible state of human death. The Bible tells us that when a human being dies apart from Christ, his soul goes immediately to hell, where it awaits the final day of judgment. And Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15, tells us that when that final day of judgment comes, these souls of the condemned in hell will be brought before the judgment seat of God and sentenced to an eternity in the lake of fire. And this final condition, Revelation 20 verse 14 calls the second death. And physical death pales in comparison to it. From this final, ultimate death, there is no escape. And so you see, the reality is that fallen man is in desperate need of being delivered from death. People may try not to think about or talk about it. And when they're forced to do so, they may try and downplay how bad it really is or even try and turn it into something good. But the stark reality is that death itself is not good. Indeed, it is far more terrible than people know. And on their own, there's no escaping it. But this passage tells us that there is one bright, glorious ray of hope in the face of the horrors of death. Namely, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He has the power and authority as the Son of God to raise us to life after our body dies. And more than that, He can deliver us from the prospect of eternal death and give us eternal life to our souls, even now. That's the good news announced to us through John 11, 1 through 44. And yet that leads us to one final question. How can Jesus do this? If God has said... The just penalty for sin is death. And if we have all sinned, then how can Jesus come along and give us resurrection and eternal life instead? And that is what brings us to Easter. You see, the answer to that question isn't given explicitly in John 11, because John 11 isn't the end of the gospel story. Rather, the empty tomb of Lazarus was only a prelude to the empty tomb of Jesus. Indeed, the resurrection of Lazarus in John 11 can only be explained ultimately by the resurrection of Jesus in John chapter 20. For Jesus has the power and authority to raise sinners from the dead and give them eternal life because he paid for our sins through his death on the cross and secured our vindication through his resurrection from the dead on that first Easter Sunday. As Paul put it in Romans 4.25, Christ was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ on the third day after his death, leaving behind an empty tomb, guaranteed the glorious resurrection of his people who believe in him. And it is so wonderfully expressed in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 23. There it says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his order... Christ, the first fruits, and then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. And how does a fallen sinner come to belong to Christ, to be among those who will be raised by him on the last day? How do they receive from Christ resurrection and eternal life? The answer is simple. Believe in him. Put your faith in him as the son of God and savior of the world and you will receive eternal life. 
And then you are to be baptized. And then you are to begin following him as your Lord, living a life in which you are learning to obey his commands and bringing glory to him for all that he has done for you. The words of Jesus in this passage come out of the pages of Scripture and direct themselves to you. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? If you haven't done so, I pray that you will do so today. And brothers and sisters, having believed in Jesus Christ, you and I belong to him. And he has freed us from the clutches of death. Believer, you no longer need to fear the prospect of physical death because it will not mean the entrance of your soul into hell. Remember Jesus' words from John 5, 24? Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. As a Christian, you have nothing to fear from physical death because, as Paul teaches in 2 Corinthians 5, when your soul leaves your body upon your death, it will go home to be with the Lord. I wonder, do you believe this? And believer, you no longer need to fear the prospect of physical death because it will only be temporary. 1 Corinthians 15 52 to 55 declares your certain hope that when the trumpet of God sounds at the end of the age, announcing the return of the risen and reigning Jesus Christ, he will come and resurrect your body from the dead and it will be incorruptible, imperishable and glorious, free from sin, never to die again. And in that day, death will be fully and finally vanquished in your life and in the entire universe as it will be swallowed up in the victory of Jesus Christ for all eternity. Do you believe this? And even now, you experience the first fruits of this resurrection life through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. For he has brought our souls from spiritual death to spiritual life by his regenerating power. Through him, we walk even now in newness of life. And his presence and work within us now serves as a foretaste and a guarantee of the full and final redemption of our bodies in the future. I wonder, do you believe this? In all these ways then, brothers and sisters, Jesus has given us, who belong to him by faith, victory over death. Depictions of his empty tomb should cause our hearts to leap for joy because they signify the death of death in our lives. Death no longer has power over us, but has been swallowed up in his victory. Oh, if the Lord tarries, we will all die in the body like everyone else, but the teeth of death have been taken out because it has become simply a doorway into the presence of Christ in heaven where we will await the final day when he will raise us from the dead in glorious bodies and bring us into the new creation. Brothers and sisters, let us minister to the dying with these truths. When someone is dying, they don't need vague generalities and circumlocations circumlocutions about what lies ahead of them. They don't need empty attempts at consolation. They need Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life. He alone offers solid answers to the vital questions about death. He alone offers real certainties in the face of death that the dying can cling to and hope. Brothers and sisters, when a person is dying, tell them about Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Point them to his cross and empty tomb. Because the stark truth about reality is, there is no hope for a dying man apart from Jesus Christ. He alone, who has left the grave behind, can offer sinners life beyond the grave. Well, in conclusion, today is Easter Sunday. Easter is the day the church celebrates the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? Because it's the way Jesus secured resurrection life for those who belong to him. The one 
who rose bodily from the dead that first Easter Sunday, now declares to a dying world, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? How a person answers that question is the most important decision they will ever make. It is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we praise you for sending your Son into the world to take on human flesh and live a perfectly righteous life as our representative, fulfilling all righteousness on our behalf, and then going to the cross, though he was a perfect man, and suffering the sinner's death that we deserve, bearing the guilt and condemnation and shame and punishment in our place and putting it away so that your wrath would turn away from us because it was poured out on him. And we thank you that you raised him from the dead on the third day, bringing him out of the tomb in a glorious body, having conquered sin and death, having won our resurrection and final vindication, And we look to Christ as our all in all, our sufficiency. He has provided us with full and complete and eternal salvation. We trust wholly in him this Easter Sunday. Oh, Lord, we praise your son, Jesus Christ. And may he be glorified in this world. May you draw many to him. We pray in his name. Amen. Lift high the name of Jesus, of Jesus our King. Make known the power of His grace, the beauty of His peace. Remember how His mercy reached, and we cried out. Lifted us to solid ground, to freedom from our sin. Oh, sing, my soul, and tell all He's done, till the earth and heavens are filled with His glory. Sinners home who oh, see.